definitely was fearless. He, I think, thought he was a little bit invincible. He was kind of a daredevil and not afraid of anything. So with the fentanyl thing, you know, I know that he had this mindset that that'll never happen to me because he's too smart and he would know. Oh my gosh, Lance was amazing. He, I know all moms say that about their kids, but he really was. He was very enigmatic and very charming and very outgoing. He never met a stranger. He could have a thoughtful conversation with anyone. He acted like everybody was his friend and you know, five minutes in a room with him and you were his friend. Um, he loved everyone. He was very accepting and non-judgmental and he was really just, he just had the coolest vibe. He was like, you do you, you do me. I love everyone. We're cool. He was just very, one of his friends after he passed wrote on my wall and she said, you know, one of the things I loved about Lance was it didn't matter if you were black or white or green or purple or yellow. He would say, hi, I'm Lance and I'm, you can be my friend and I love you. And that's who he was. The first thing when I think of Lance, he was unapologetically himself. Like, what you see is what you get, and you either loved him or you didn't, and he didn't really care either way. But he, you know, as a child, he was obsessed with Spider-Man. So from three until six, he wore the same Spider-Man costume every single day. And if we had to go somewhere the Spider-Man costume wasn't appropriate, he would put on jeans and a white Oxford shirt and fake glasses because that's what Peter Parker wore. He was kind of obsessive and when he committed to something, he committed fully and wholly. So if he was interested in something, you could bet he knew every single thing there was to know about that topic. He would learn absolutely everything and then I had to hear all about it. So I know all about Spider-Man and the Power Rangers and Yu-Gi-Oh and more than I ever wanted to know about all of those subjects because if he knew it, he was sharing it. When I talked to people, the thing that people remember most is he was constantly talking. And Lance talked a lot about everything, but he was so smart. He knew a lot about a lot of things and he could talk to, he could have an intelligent conversation with anyone about pretty much any topic. He was a little bit of a handful, not gonna lie. Most of my gray hairs are, are from Lance. He is very, very intelligent. He was always smarter than I was. So he was always one step ahead. So. He was a bit of a challenging teenager, you know, always pushing the rules and living life. He, we, the thing we say about Lance is he lived life on his terms and he really did. He, he did what he wanted to when he wanted to and I mean, he didn't hurt people. He was kind and gentle and loving, but life was too short and he had a life to live and couldn't be bothered with pettiness as he called it. He was definitely not afraid, and I think that he had this false sense of security because he thought he was street smart, and he thought that he would know, he would know better. But on February 23rd of 2020, he bought two Oxys, what he thought were Oxys, from some random guy at a club in Lawrence called The Hawk. And on March 3rd, he messaged a friend after he went to bed at 11.59, PM, he got home from work and messaged a friend and said that his back hurt and he was taking an oxy and going to bed. And then I found him the next day. And toxicology showed there was no oxycodone in his system. So the pill that he took that he thought was oxy was counterfeit, it was fentanyl. So he didn't know the difference. He bought two and the police found the other one in his room and they even said that it, it looked real. And they said, looking at it, you would not have known that it was fake. It looked like an oxy. There was no way to know. I would say he wasn't an addict, but he definitely liked to party and have a good time with his friends. And again, he was fearless and maybe a little bit reckless and made some choices that he shouldn't make sometimes. I would describe his drug use as recreational and more of a social party kind of kind of use. He was a pothead. He really liked some marijuana. Um, and honestly, in the beginning, that didn't bother me because it was a lot better than a lot of the stuff that he could be doing. Uh, 
you know, to be honest, that day is still kind of a little bit of a blur. Um, I remember screaming his name and, and running down the stairs and somehow I had the foresight to tell my daughter to go wait in the front yard for 911 while I put all of our dogs up so that, because I knew a lot of people would be coming in with the dogs. Um, that's about all I remember is, is calling 911. Um, she was telling me to start CPR and I was telling her I couldn't and she was emphatic that I get him on the floor and start CPR and I remember yelling at her that I used to be an EMT and I could tell her it was far too late for that. And then that's about the time everybody came in. It's pretty much your worst nightmare. You know, I had this, this inkling because I honestly didn't know what else it would be. He didn't really do anything else. And he was, you know, he went to work and he came home and had gone to bed. So it wasn't like he was out partying or, you know, doing anything like that. So I just had no idea what else it could be. He had been complaining of some back pain for a couple of weeks and had been going to the chiropractor, but he'd also been complaining of chest pain. So, of course, in the back of my head, I'm worried that there was something heart-related that I'd failed to address and didn't take him to the doctor for because we figured it was just related to his back. Um, but that was just in the back of, back of my head. And he passed away on March 4th, and on my birthday, which is May 19th, we got the toxicology reports that it was fentanyl. Like I said, I kind of had suspected just because I didn't know what else it would have been. But at the same time, I couldn't believe that, that he would do that. He knew better than to take something that he wasn't prescribed. He knew better than that. So even though he was fearless and reckless and liked to party, I really never thought that he'd take straight drugs from somebody he didn't know. He was smarter than that. You know, he was the guy that every time his sister would go out, he'd say, don't ever take anything that somebody gives you because you don't know what it is. And he would lecture her about how they're lacing everything with, with fentanyl and there can be fentanyl in anything. And he would lecture her about that and say, you know, take a water bottle, don't ever leave the top off, carry it with you, don't ever leave your drink unattended. So he would give her all of those safety tips. So it really never, I didn't worry a lot that he would fall victim to something like this because he did know better. And he's still not here. And the reason I shared his story, I was hesitant to share his story at first because, you know, there's such a stigma with drug use. And I ultimately decided to share his story because if it can happen to us, it can happen to anybody. If we had to bury our child, it can happen to anybody. They can lose their child just as easily. And this is a war on our children's lives and our only weapon is awareness. So my hope is that you know, parents will share Lance's face with them and tell them his story and tell them how much his sister and his dad and I have struggled and tell them how Lance was amazing and smart and had a bright future ahead of him and now he's gone and my hope is that those kids will stop and think about Lance and remember his face and make a better choice than he did.